Hello everyone, welcome back to the workshop. Um, today um, we're going to start a new project. Uh, I have the D10 engine on the bench and I'm going to have a go at the Yamaha clutch conversion um, that's been out in Bantam world for quite some time. Uh, certainly popular with the trials uh, riders, the trials guys. Um, we're going to try and put the retro mechanica stamp on it, hopefully, uh, see how we get on. Um, I think it's probably going to be two or maybe three parts. We'll just see how much progress we make. Um, first part, there's probably going to be a bit of talking. Um, I need to explain the whys and wherefores. So usual disclaimer uh, regarding waffling. Um, hopefully you enjoy the video. Um, we have had quite a few um, new subscribers come along. So welcome aboard. Uh, thank you very much indeed for subscribing. It is appreciated. And as ever, to those of you who've been with me um, for quite some time, um, thanks for sticking with me, and it's always a pleasure to spend some time with you. Um, right, okay, um, I'll get over to the bench and we'll have a look at this new job. Well, I've got the D10 four-speed engine back up on the bench, and um, I haven't done a thing to it since I bought it. Um, I did make a video um, when I first bought this thing of sort of an initial impression um, of the engine and we, we had a bit of a look around it and we found quite a few things wrong with it and since then it's really been sitting in a corner um, hoping for attention I suppose um, but anyway it's back up on the bench and we're going to have a bit of a look at it if you haven't seen that initial video uh, now might be a good opportunity to go back and um, acquaint yourself with it. Uh, for, for those of you that did watch, let me just recap a few uh, basic points about the engine. Now there's quite a number of pieces missing. Um, we've got the um, primary cover off here and we can see uh, no primary chain, no clutch pack, um, there's no piston fitted. We knew that there would be no electrics, um, which is not an issue because we're going to fit a modern electrical system. Um, we haven't been into the gearbox, so we don't know if there's any pieces missing in there, but I wouldn't be surprised, quite frankly, if there were uh, bits missing. And the crankcases were in a fairly sorry state as well. Um, various pulled threads, uh, broken out threads that are going to need welding. So yeah, uh, quite a body of work really uh, to make it a viable engine. But um, having said that, I think it's worth saving and I see it as an opportunity because uh, this is going to be my candidate for modifications and there's quite a few um, modifications that have been done to the Bantam engine over the years uh, people trying to get the best out of them and um, improve the performance a little bit so we're going to push this one a little bit and see how far we can get and the first thing that we're going to do is have a look at the clutch so the few pieces of the clutch that we actually have we'll just take them off now we've got our um, spline sensor hub we've got um, the normal bantam uh, clutch drum or clutch basket if you prefer a fairly weighty piece of metal um, familiar clutch sorry uh, kickstarter ratchet mechanism on the back uh, we should have a thrust bearing oh, we do it's stuck to the bottom of the um, sensor hub a three-speed models had a thrust washer the later ones had this thrust bearing arrangement so we'll keep that safe and then another departure from the three speed models is this um, composite bush um, on the three speeders it was an all bronze top hat bush and then here we have this um, steel center with a, um, a bronze outer and it's a, a plain bush so that is our D10 clutch. What I have here and what I intend to fit, I'll just get that on there for you, is a Yamaha clutch. And this is quite a popular modification. We are by no means the first to do it. I think we are the first on YouTube, so there we go. Um, but certainly not the first to do the modification. Um, it's been quite well. Um, quite well documented um, in other sort of areas, um, largely in the trials community. Um, 
and I think some of the racing guys do it. And you know, there's probably a number of road bikes out there uh, running around with Yamaha clutches as well. So that is the plan. Um, so let me just take that off of there. And what we'll do is we'll go over to the bench. Well, we're at the bench, but we'll go over to the parts on the bench and we'll talk a little bit about who's done it in the past and why it's a good idea. And I do apologize. This video is probably going to have a bit of talking in it, but I think we need to, um, I think we need to sort of lay out the whys and wherefores uh, before we get into the um, actual modification. So let me just move the camera and I'll be right back. Well, there's our two assemblies side by side. Uh, before we get into them, um, I did mention earlier that we're not the first to carry out this conversion. And obviously I can't credit everyone that's ever done it uh, because I don't know who they are. But um, there are two individuals that I would like to mention. And the first is a chap called Andy Lorenz. Um, Andy is a member of the BSA Owners Club, and he um, has carried out this conversion and he published his method in the club magazine, which I believe is called The Star. Um, I'm not a member of that club and I don't get the magazine, uh, but if you are, then you will be able to read um, all about it, as they say, uh, in the magazine. Um, I did have a bit of a conversation with Andy uh, via email and he was kind enough to send me some of the notes that he made whilst he was doing the conversion. So that will definitely give us a bit of a steer. So thank you, Andy. And the other individual is Charlie Prescott. Um, those of you that are in the classic trials world will probably know Charlie. Um, he's a prolific builder of uh, British trials bikes and has been on the go since I think the 60s. I'm, I may be wrong. Uh, I don't know exactly how old Charlie is, but he's definitely been on the go for a good few years and has built a lot of um, very competitive bikes. Um, his website is BSA Otter. And if you don't know what a BSA Otter is, you will do after you've visited Charlie's website. Um, anyway, he did um, a Bantam trials bike. I think he's done more than one, actually. And he details um, how he did the Yamaha clutch conversion on his website. So there you go. Um, definitely uh, a couple of starters for us there. Um, I'm sure that we will um, deviate slightly and we'll develop our own way of doing things and we'll tailor it to our facilities. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't want to plagiarize anybody else's work. Um, so we will definitely be referring to the Lorenz method uh, and the Prescott method uh, as we go through. Um, I'm intending these videos to be a bit of a guide um, to anyone that wants to do this conversion, providing that it works, of course. Um, well, if it doesn't, then it'll be a guide on what to avoid. Um, but I hesitate to use the word how to um, because, um, again, you will develop your own methods. You probably improve on mine and you'll tailor it to um, your own facilities. So that said, um, let's get on and have a look at these clutches. Right, first of all then, uh, I'm going to pose and hopefully answer two questions. And the first question is, why are we bothering to do this? Um, what is the point in uh, doing this clutch conversion? Um, I don't have any experience riding BSA Bantams in a competitive arena, um, but plenty of people do. And um, they say that when pushed hard, um, off-road particularly, uh, the clutch can slip, um, particularly if you change the gearing, which the trials guys tend to do. Um, they change the primary ratios. They put a great big dinner plate of a sprocket on the back wheel, and then they throw it at an incline and expect it to climb. And um, quite often the clutches will slip. So um, that's the main reason why this conversion came about. Um, the next question, if you want to do this conversion, what do you need to buy? Uh, what is this clutch from? And um, I can answer that. This is a Yamaha YBR125 clutch. Uh, model code is 5V. And I believe um, that there was an earlier incarnation of this conversion that used the YB100 clutch, uh, which is a model code 13N. Um, but they're getting a little bit thin on the ground now. 
Um, probably they're all fitted to bantams, that's why. Uh, so thin on the ground generally means more expensive. Um, but there are plenty of these YBR 125 clutches around. Um, this one came off the popular um, auction site. Uh, it was less than £30. Um, and I do need to get some uh, plates for it. I haven't got them yet, but... Um, you can get um, uprated plates. EBC do a set of plates for them. Um, so, yeah, lots of them around. Fairly popular small bike. And um, I think you can get the complete clutch assembly brand new for about £70, pounds, um, which is a, a Chinese-made um, item. But it's my understanding, um, not entirely sure, it's my understanding that Yamaha get their clutches made in China. So it's possible that if you buy one of those, you know, you're getting OEM quality anyway. Um, I don't know for sure, but that's, um, that's a possibility. Anyway, you shouldn't have a problem getting hold of one of these um, if you want to do this job. So we'll have a look at the components um, that make up the clutch. Um, there is this um, aluminium pressure plate with a, a push rod which is uh, bolted into position. You have, um, again, aluminium um, center hub with a steel center. It looks as though the hub was cast around it. And that steel center has the splines um, that transmit the drive to the gearbox. There you go. And then you have your clutch drum or clutch basket if you prefer again cast aluminium and that is riveted to this um, steel um, helical gear uh, three rivets and underneath this helical gear is the cushion drive arrangement which we'll be dispensing with um, because we don't need that on the banter so straight away we can see that we need to uh, get rid of this helical drive we need to recover the um, the sprocket and the kickstarter assembly from the bantam clutch which is riveted on in much the same way and then we need to transfer um, this drive onto this clutch so that will be the first order of events the next thing we need to do is um, find a means of making the splines in this hub match the BSA shaft um, which means we need to make them look like the splines in this hub um, from what I've been reading um, the usual method that people employ is to take a file to these splines and basically hand fit them um, to this configuration here. Now, I'm going to try a different method. Um, I have another one of these. So I'm going to try and make a component that we can drop into here. We can bore this out, hopefully, and drop, um, drop a, a new um, hub, effectively, into here and um, convert it to the BSA splines. Uh, I don't know how successful that's going to be, but that's the first sort of deviation um, I'm going to try from the Lorenz and Prescott method. Um, we'll give it a go, see what happens. Uh, we may have to resort to um, you know, the hand fitting, but if we can put an actual um, a new center hub or a new center uh, component into here I think that will be um, quite a good way of doing it so there's that and then of course we will have to um, get the spacing right we'll have to make sure that everything um, you know rotates properly um, the BSA clutch uses the um, thrust washer I think we're gonna um, try to use a thrust washer between the hub and clutch drum so that we get nice free rotation we'll give that a go but um yeah that is the plan
that's the way forward. Um, so I think the first order of events is to try and get this helical gear um, off of here and uh, we'll drill these rivets out over on the milling machine. Right, so we're up on the milling table. Um, apologies for the glare coming from the window. I don't have blinds fitted, so uh, I can't do anything about that, but hopefully it won't spoil your, uh, your view. So we're going to go after these three rivets. Uh, you can see the heads there and the, um, the tails on that side. And um, when you're removing rivets, it's always a good idea to have a look and see uh, what side they've been reacted on. And go for the other side because um, they'll be work hardened on the reacted side. So you can see in there, this is the side that they, um, they reacted against. Um, so they'll be pretty hard on that side. So if we go after the heads, um, they'll be softer. And it's always good practice to get the heads if you can and only drill down deep enough to get the head off, <clears throat> excuse me, to get the head off. And um, then you can punch, um, support the back and punch the rivet tail through. Uh, that way you don't damage the component that you are um, removing. Uh, we don't need this gear wheel anyway, but um, it's always good practice not to destroy things if you don't have to. So that's what we're going to do. Um, yeah, not particularly well riveted, quite frankly. Um, if I was signing this off, I'd make him do it again. But there we go. It, um, it did the job. Uh, and now it's going to come apart. So let's get it clamped down. And uh, I'm not going to rely on these fingers to clamp it down on. Um, I've got a tubular parallel, which is actually um, the inner race out of an aircraft undercarriage bearing. And um, the great thing about bearing races is they're ground all over. So their precision dimensions make really good parallels. Uh, so if you can get hold of um, large bearing races, worth keeping hold of um, because they do make good parallels. So let's get it reasonably central. And then uh, a bit of packing on there, and we'll clamp it down. And this is just one of those clamp kits that I think it came with the milling machine from new because it's the same brand as the milling machine. When I bought the milling machine, it came with it. Um, it's not in particularly good condition, it all needs a bit of a clean up, but oops, excuse me, it does the job. We won't go bananas, just enough to stop it from moving, and um, I'll get set up and we'll do some drilling. Right, we're set up to um, drill these rivet heads off. I've um, got my uh, drill chuck in there, um, 4.6 millimeter cobalt. I think the rivets are probably about five millimeters, um, there or thereabouts. Um, so we should be okay, and uh, we'll have a bit of sauce with our chips, I think. And let's have a go. See how we're looking. We're anywhere near the centre. Just need to move that ever so slightly. a bit more like it. I expected the rivets to be a bit harder than this to be honest with you, they're not very hard at all. There we go exactly what we wanted. If I can get you in a bit a bit closer than that. One second, let me move the camera because I'd like to show you this. Right, so we've drilled on centre and we've drilled just deep enough that the head has come clean away. 
see there's a rivet head there and that's what you're after you want to just drill the head off and leave the rivet tail um, in situ you can drill a little bit more uh, just to go just build, just subsurface and that will help to loosen the rivet but what we'll do is um, when we get the other ones out we'll put something on the back of the rivet underneath on the to cover the tail to back it up like a socket or something like that and then we'll drive the rivet tail uh, through from this side state that chisel from this side through uh, the drum and that way we won't damage anything we won't enlarge any holes because um, that's the the worst thing really when people drill rivets out sometimes and they just smash right through and you almost guarantee that the holes that you're drilling through get larger or they become um, oval and um, we're probably not going to use these holes again but you know why um, why make a mess of it when we don't have to so that's exactly what I wanted I just want to take the head off um, sometimes you just have to give them a little bit of a tap or just prise at them with a punch but in this case um, they came clean off with a drill bit so that's a win uh, I'll do the other two and um, we'll get back to the bench there we go that's all three removed and all the heads came out in the same manner so um, that was that was good pleased with that so now we need to knock these through and um, if we just beat on that, obviously we're going to put lots of force through our um, clutch drum. We don't want to do that. So what we'll do is we'll support it with a socket underneath. And this is one of them jobs where um, basically you need to grow an extra few hands. So hopefully you can still see. We are quite zoomed in. So I'm just going to hold it like that. Get the parallel punch in there. And out she goes. we go oh excuse my arm getting in the way there's our rivet tail you see they didn't put much of a reaction on it at all really um, appreciate it's not focusing very well because the camera zoomed but um, I think you can see that there's not much of a reaction on the end of there um, and that's what was holding the clutch together so good luck Yamaha that's all I can say uh, I don't know how long that would last but um, well, that's up to them. Right, I will get the rest of the rivets out and um, we'll have a look at um, what we're left with. There you go. Slightly better focus now that we're not quite so zoomed in. Yeah, I wouldn't be happy with that, but there you go. Um, I wasn't signing the job off. If I was, I certainly would have... Uh, made them do it again but anyway um, let's have a look this should now come off um, I don't know how tight it will be oh, there we go oh it's all coming to bits so there's the cushion drive with all the rubbers in it uh, we'll put that to one side we don't need that bit. Quite interesting though. There's the top plate that came off. And that's what we're left with. Oh, that weighs nothing at all, which is um, which is good. So we have these um, raised portions, uh, these lugs that are um, part of the cushion drive. The I guess they're the drive dogs for the cushion drive. Um, and we need to get rid of those uh, they need to go so they'll have to be um, machined off because they're going to get in the way of us fitting um, our sprocket and then we need to um, remove the sprocket from the BSA clutch and we're going to do exactly the same job um, with the rivets we'll drill the heads off and then we'll punch them through uh, before obviously before we do that we'll remove the kickstarter mechanism um, but yeah exactly the same uh, they're domed head rivets um, it's sometimes useful if you put a little flat on them they do look as though they've got a slight flat on them actually it looks as though they were riveted with a, a flat dolly rather than a domed dolly um, yeah 
but that's given us a little flat to work on so we can um, we can drill at that so we'll get them out um, and then we will have uh, our sprocket free and then we can work on getting it fitted to our Yamaha clutch drum so let me just wipe my hands bear with me and we'll get set up to do just right before I take the BSA clutch apart I'm just going to get a height measurement because when we um, when we fit the Yamaha drum to the BSA sprocket it's going to be taller um, so we're going to need to know how much to take off uh, these fingers so I think before we strip it down it'd be a good idea to get uh, get this measurement so I've got my, um, my height gauge out uh, it's a nice piece of kit my brother got me that a couple of Christmases ago I really like it and um, I've got my little surface plate so that should give us um, an accurate reading let's put it into inches to start with um, because I imagine it was made in inches let's just zero it out make sure that the uh, it's been in the box so it should be clean but we'll just make sure let's just zero it at that and then I'll just hold this excuse my hand in the way I'll just hold it just to make sure it doesn't rock it's only it's only sitting on a quite a small diameter uh, I'm getting 2268 inches. I'll just make a note of that. 2268. 268,000 is a bit of a strange one. Um, I'm not very good with um, fractional inches. My brain doesn't work very well um, in that department. I'm just trying to figure out if that is a true fraction I don't think it is is it um, what's 930 seconds I think it's 280 I wonder if they're just a bit short of 930 seconds or if that is um, intended I'm just gonna zero it out again just to be yeah it goes to zero I'll do it in millimeters this time because the lathe is in millimeters so we'll probably be um, where well, we will be turning to a millimetre value. Uh, is that 57, 58, 59? We we'll say 57.6, let's say that. 57.6. Right, made a note of that. We're good. We can strip it down and uh, not worry about how tall it used to be. Okay, everything is now stripped down. Um, I've taken all the rivets out. So this came apart quite easily, as you saw. Um, this was a bit tougher. The rivets are quite um, they're quite tough in this. And um, I did say drill the heads off. Um, and that is the usual best practice with riveting, is to drill the heads off and knock the tails out. But on this occasion, uh, I'm going to say do it a different way because on the Kickstarter ratchet, which fits over here like this. I'm hoping you can see this. Let me just move it a little bit. The tails are on this side and the heads are inside the clutch drum here. And if you drill the heads off and then try to knock the rivet tails through in the usual way, um, you've got very little on this surface to back them up with um, and you don't want to damage the uh, you get it into focus. You don't want to damage the Kickstarter ratchet, um, which works. There's a little circlet that holds this pinion on, which I removed. But um, yeah, that's your Kickstarter ratchet. So you don't want to damage that surface there because we've all had a bike with a dodgy Kickstarter ratchet and um, it's not a lot of fun, is it? So um, you want to preserve this. So my advice is to drill the tails. They're quite big. Um, the reactions on the um, on the back of the BSA clutch are quite big, so you've got plenty of meat to drill. Drill the tails, um, break the reactions off, and then knock them out that way. That's my advice to you, uh, and that worked quite well. That was successful. Uh, none of the holes. We're not going to use this piece again, but like I said before, there's no point in ruining things because if you ruin one bit, you might end up ruining the bit you're trying to save. Uh, but as you can see, none of the holes ended up overlized. They're all nice and reusable. There's our sprocket. 
uh, the holes are good in that as well so that is going to end up on there but before we can do that we need to get rid of these um, um, drive dogs <laughs> my mind went completely blank we have to get rid of these drive dogs for the cushion drive on the Yamaha um, so we'll do that next right so I'm just holding the clutch drum uh, in the bikes I've got a um, small v-block in here just spacing the fingers away from the vice jaws is nice uh, well as good as the, the bench will allow anyway a nice firm grip I don't want to break off these um, fingers um, these uh, drive dogs they're quite fragile um, I was reading uh, Andy Lorenzi's notes and he actually broke one off of his uh, clutch drum while he was removing them and he ended up with a great big hole in his clutch drum that he had to live with so we're not going to do that hopefully um, we are going to um, cut them off and then mill them flush so first thing I'm going to do is try and reduce them in size with the uh, the mill yard method uh, for those of you that know will know what I'm talking about when I say the mill yard method so I'm going to chop a bit off and uh, and then we'll go over to the milling machine, finish off the job. So there's one, and uh, I won't put you through the monotony of watching me chop them all off. So let me get it to a position where we can mill it. So here we are on the milling machine. Um, I've already skimmed or rather milled one of these down to almost um, flush and um, you can see I've got quite a Heath Robertson affair here holding it all down I've got two v-blocks underneath this is the nut um, steering stem nut off some long ago motorbike that I was working on and then um, the uh, aluminium spacer in the nut it doesn't really matter you know it's just stuff I hunted through the scrap box and found that's why I don't throw stuff away. I don't have any fancy, well, I've got one set of milling clamps, but I don't have any sort of fancy um, hold down kit for the mill. Uh, certainly not at the moment. Anyway, I just use um, whatever I can cobble together, really. Uh, but this is working quite well. It's quite a satisfying process. Um, I am going to skim the whole uh, back surface of um, the clutch, I think, once I'm done. I'll probably do that in the lathe just to make sure that we've got a good um, surface for the sprocket um, but let's just put a bit of cut on and uh, take a bit of a pass it almost takes it all in one go, just got to feed in a little bit on each pass on this one at least But it's just one of those processes that you just chip away at it and it's quite satisfying to just munch the metal away using the milling machine which I haven't used very often in all fairness since I bought it um, it's nice to get on it and be using it Anyway, I'm going to keep chomping away at this and uh, I shall bring you back when we've got a little bit further on. Right, here we are again. Um, I've had a few days off from this job. Uh, you won't know this, of course, due to the wonders of video, but um, yeah, I had a few other things to do. Uh, the last time you saw this piece here, uh, it was in the milling machine. I was removing the drive dogs, which I've now done. Um, I've got a slight tooling mark here, which is uh, my fault, unfortunately. Um, I switched from feeding on the knee to feeding on the uh, fine feed and I forgot that the fine feed's got a slight problem. Um, there's a loose key uh, on the uh, feed shaft and occasionally you get more than you asked for, which in some walks of life is a good thing. 
but on the milling machine, uh, rarely so. Um, so we've got a slight tooling mark, you can just feel it. Um, I don't think it'll affect the performance in any way, it just looks a little bit unsightly. But once the chain wheel is on there, you won't see it. But uh, I will always know it's there. Um, but anyway, uh, onwards and upwards. The next job is to open out this diameter here. And that is so that uh, the register on the chain wheel will fit through. Um, I think we're also going to have to take this step here off. Um, and also probably machine this step flush. Because we want uh, our chain wheel and our clutch drum uh, as close together as we can get to maximize our um, spline engagement when it's all together. However, that does pose a slight problem because we've gone from a gear driven clutch where it doesn't matter if the gear is hard up against the um, clutch drum. We've gone to a sprocket now or a chain wheel and we need um, clearance for our, our chain, the width of our chain. So effectively, we're going to make, oh, I can keep a hold of it. We're going to make it like that and there wouldn't be any, any room for the chain. So I think we're going to have to use some of this thickness here and machine uh, a relief for the chain. So um, that will have to be done as well. But um, for the time being, I think we need to get this in the fore jaw, grip it on this, um, this diameter here, which is, you know, there's quite a good bit of meat there. There's some thickness there and um, clock it in onto this diameter. So I'll go and do that and um, we'll have a look at it. Right, that's us clocked in on the four jaw, um, about a hundredth of a mil is the best I can get. Um, we could chase it around all day and probably uh, not get any better, but uh, I think that's more than acceptable. Um, if you're not entirely sure how to um, clock in something in the four jaw chuck, there's some good tutorials on YouTube. Um, Four Jaw Fun by Double Boost is is, uh, is a good one to watch if you're uh, unsure how to do this. But uh, I'm sure many of you out there have got your own techniques and uh, certainly don't need me to, um, to show you how to do it. So we shall get on and make the hole bigger. Right, we're set up uh, with the boring bar and to be fair to him, he gets out a lot more these days so he's not as boring as he used to be. Uh, before I open up the hole, um, here's the old uh, clutch drum or clutch basket if you prefer. And uh, what I've done is, I've got a lump of 6063 here. Uh, the, the light's not great, I apologise for the reflection. Uh, but I've just turned up a plug gauge. It just, just goes in. Um, if you press it hard enough it will go on. So that's what I'm going to um, use as a guide to machine the hole. Uh, because I can't get in there with the uh, chain wheel and you've got to be careful just relying on because it's quite a small surface area uh, measuring instruments such as a, um, a snap gauge or something like that are quite difficult to use so um, good idea to turn up a plug gauge and then you know for sure um, where you are with it and what we can do is we can get somewhere near and we can test and adjust uh, and um, sort it out from there. So that's what we're going to do. Um, I'll try and get you a slightly better view than what you've got now and um, we'll do some uh, machining. I think that's a reasonable view of the business end. Um, I touched off and zeroed out the cross slide. Uh, we're running at 315 RPM and um, the target is um, 1 and 5 8 so one inch and 625 thousandths uh, which is coming out at 41.28 millimeters uh, we're currently at 38 millimeters on the uh, Yamaha clutch so we want 3.28 millimeters uh, so we'll get somewhere near and then we'll start messing around with the plug gauge and um, seeing how we get on so I'm going to take a cut now and we'll just see how it cuts it should cut quite nicely I think Okay, we've got the, uh, the stop set as well, so that we uh, we don't go running into the chuck. Let's just have a bit of squirty juice in there.
you know. So that was about 0.6 of a mil. We shall rinse and repeat until we get to where we need to be and uh, I shall bring you back when we're somewhere near. Okay, I hope you can see at that distance I've zoomed you in a little bit, but we are... We are there. And that is full contact. Oop, squeaky. Full contact all the way around. So I'm very happy with that. So we'll take it out of the chuck. Get it back on the bench, try it on the chain wheel. Right, I've got you up on top of the vice, uh, peering down at the bench. Here is the chain wheel. There is our um, newly machined uh, clutch. Let's just make sure we've got no dirt and debris on the surfaces. Let's give that a quick, a quick one over with a brush. So we know that our Mandrel fits in nicely, or our um, plug gauge, and then this should be ever so slightly tighter, which it is. <coughs> that is exactly the fit I wanted. Um, we're not trying to turn it into a camshaft, we want it to run nice and concentrically, um, and that fits in there nice. So we are going to have to machine what's left of this little lip away here and I think I probably will um, go right across and take this lip down to um, the same level just so that the chain wheel sits in there nice and flush uh, and then we'll have to we'll definitely have to machine a relief in here for the chain otherwise the chain will uh, not clear but I'm happy with that so far Um, definitely getting there, definitely getting there. So I'll figure out now how to machine, um, how to machine this off because obviously we can't hold it that way around in the chuck because we won't be able to get to it and holding it that way around in the chuck um, kind of leaves these fingers rather exposed. I don't really want to grip on these fingers um, because they look to me as though they would break off and uh, that would be the end of the exercise but maybe possibly I can do something with this use it as a fixture I'm not entirely sure how because if I put a washer across here then obviously it's going to be holding right on the area that I want to machine but um, I'll have to have a bit of a think I'm not entirely sure how I'm going to do that quite frankly but um, I'll have a bit of a think I'm sure we'll figure it out Right, my friends, uh, I've just looked at the length of this video and we're sort of just getting past the 40 minute mark. So I think we will call it there and um, any further progress will be in the next video. Um, I have just been having a bit of a think about this and I'll uh, share my musings with you very briefly. Um, I'm convinced about taking this, this sort of lip here off. That needs to go. Uh, I don't know how the other guys did it. I'll have to have a look at... Uh, have a look at the notes that I've got and see how they did it but um, for me at least that has to go um, I I do see some utility however in leaving a bit of a gap um, between the edge of the chain wheel and the clutch because I think that you know the, the sort of the less we can take out of the the clutch to get the chain to clear the better really because we don't want to be eating too deeply into this material but at the same time, obviously, we don't want to have a huge space or a huge gap here because we will lose spline engagement. So I'm thinking possibly I might look into taking this lip off and then putting a shim plate in here to raise this deck height up to the same level as this and see how we are. We've got a nice stable platform then 
um, if we put rivets in um, we don't want a gap in between because they will react in the gap that's what rivets like to do um, and if we put bolts in um, again we'll have portions of the bolt running through fresh air so I don't really like that idea so a shim might be the way forward but anyway we shall um, we shall have a play around with it and uh, in the next video um, I will show you everything that I've done um, so thank you very much indeed for watching um, I hope you've enjoyed it so far and uh, I hope you're finding it an interesting project and uh, I shall see you on the next one bye bye